and welcome to Capitol Hill. I'm Lyndall Curtis. The Prime Minister addressed the ACTU Congress today. In a fighting speech, she dealt with people's worries about the impact of the carbon price on the cost of living and their jobs. And she's made it clear she's sticking around for the fight as she acknowledged the scale of the difficulties her government faces. One of those difficulties for the government and the union movement is the impact on the reputation given the health, union, sorry, health services union scandal. While on last night on Q&A, Joe Hockey's views on same-sex marriage were challenged too. Joining us to discuss the day are Labor MP Ed Husick and Liberal MP Alan Tudge. Welcome to you both. G'day, Lyndall. Alan. We'll go, we'll go first to the Prime Minister's speech. She says she understands the size of the task her government faces, but she took on some of the issues directly. We should not allow days of political pressure to become a council of despair. Rather than that, we should ensure that we stiffen our spine and we get on with the work that working Australians want us to do. The work that means such a difference to them and their families. The work that Labor people around the country rely on us to achieve. I am absolutely determined to do that and prepared to take all of my energy and all of my vigour into the next 500 days as we move towards the election campaign and beyond, I fight for Australia. I fight for the Australian values we hold dear. I fight for the Australian way. And as Prime Minister in these days where Australians are so frequently invited to be afraid, to be afraid of carbon pricing, to be afraid about managing their cost of living, to be afraid about their jobs, to be afraid about the future. As your Prime Minister, I will move the Australian people from these days of fear to days of hope. Ed, Julia Gillard dealt very directly with people's concerns about cost of living on the carbon tax, saying there is nothing to fear when the carbon price starts. Has this speech been a long time coming? I think it's good that uh, the speech was made and I think it's important that we keep uh, reinforcing that you know, we have a massive agenda that is basically being dealt with right here, right now, be it from you know, totally renewing our technological infrastructure, be it uh, also renewing and replacing school infrastructure and providing opportunity for people through education, be it through the things that we're doing to lift the pressures off families in terms of the uh, support that we're providing there, the challenge of climate change being tackled, but and, importantly, as, and importantly as people get older, that they have the dignity of good care uh, and having a good aged care system. So there but, are some big things there. But as the Prime Minister acknowledged, the government's a long way behind in the polls. Uh, she pointed out you're 500 days until the election. Does the speech really only matter if people are still listening to hear the message she's got? Well, I think uh, you're going to have a, a period of time over the next few months where a lot of the myths will be busted about uh, the type of things that we've done in terms of reform vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate change and getting us to use energy more efficiently uh, and to be able to deal with those big challenges. Uh, I think it is important that we, uh, we see those myths busted and uh, I think people do, you know, we have to keep working on um, talking on those issues, focusing on the things that matter to people. Alan, do you think there's a real reason to fear, for people to fear about their cost of living and their job security? Unemployment's below 5%, the economy's still growing, and while you say the carbon tax is going to have an impact, the government's introducing it in what is a low inflation environment. Yeah, I think, I think the Prime Minister's in dreamland if she thinks that the carbon tax will have no impact. And she clearly hasn't even read her own economic documents because her own documents say that in the first year alone, electricity prices will go up 10%. Gas prices will go up 10%. That some industries will be cut in half, such as the aluminium industry. If you look at some of the Treasury modelling, say in the state of Victoria in New South Wales, the Victorian Treasury modelling says that 24,000 jobs will be put in jeopardy. In New South Wales, 37,000 jobs will be put in jeopardy. This is why people are concerned, because, because of her own modelling. And this is just in year one when the carbon price is 
$23 when it's forecast but, but, to go up to $150. But the government's already uh, giving out money or going to be giving out over the next uh, uh, few months. Uh, money, it says, will more than compensate most people for the impact of the carbon price. And that's before it, uh, it increased the, the family tax benefit part A in the budget, something that but, at the moment you're voting for. But people know that the compensation will be there in year one and maybe in year two, but then it will disappear. But meanwhile, the carbon tax starts at $23 and is legislated to increase to $29 in three years' time and up to $37 by 2020 and up to $135 by, by 2050. That is the fact. People know that that compensation won't be lasting forever, but the carbon tax will continue to go up and up and up. Ed, uh, the, the concerns that the Prime Minister picked up on uh, talking about job security and cost of living, they were reflected in the Reserve Bank minutes of its last board meeting that were released today, saying that's flowing into to keeping consumers cautious. Apart from uh, the, the rhetoric that Julia Gillard have today, has your government done enough in terms of the budget, irrespective of whether it's viewed as class warfare or not, to help ease those cost of living pressures, to put money into people's pockets so that they do feel they are able to spend again? Well, I think the Reserve Bank's done a convenient flick pass. I mean, I, I think, if anything, the Reserve Bank is the biggest break in terms of uh, future uh, growth and spurring on growth in the economy in terms of interest rates and the level that they're set at. What we've effectively done is uh, reduce the pressure uh, or any sort of, or given the room to move, I should say, in terms of interest rates by bringing in a surplus budget, reducing government spending, freeing up cash within the economy, allowing business to invest. So I think, uh, and you look at our economy and you compare it to, say, Spain, where they're dealing with 20% unemployment, less than 5% here, I mean, we've got some good things to crow about. And as for class warfare, I've loved this whole debate about class warfare. Apparently the North Shore was maligned last week. Go and talk to kids in, in uh, my neck of the woods who worry that their postcode affects their ability to be able to even get a job interview. I mean, it's one of the most bizarre debates we've seen in the last week. Alan, per uh, perception uh, affects the way uh, people act, whether they're worried about spending or worried about their jobs. Sure. Your leader sure. has spent a long time going around the country uh, saying the sorts of things you are saying about the potential impact of the carbon tax. Do, do, has that fed the perceptions? Well, well but, but Lyndall, these, we're not making these figures up. I mean, these are the government's own figures. They're in the own documents which, which the Prime Minister has published. The, the figures of a 10% increase of electricity prices is in the government's own modelling. And that's year one with the $23 uh, per tonne carbon tax. And that carbon tax in their own modelling, is forecast to go up. So we're just, t we're just telling the truth according to the government's own modelling. So I can't see how that, that is fear-mongering. But can I just pick up on a, a point which Ed made? And I'll just say that to Ed, finally the government has realised that there's a relationship between fiscal policy and interest rates. And we have been saying this for a very long time. And we've been saying that the, part of the reason that interest rates have been higher than what they should is because the government has been... Um, clocking up massive deficits, $150 billion of deficits over the last four years. So if it's I good could... to hear the government finally um, acknowledge that there is that relationship. Ed, if well, I could ask, you, if I could ask be... you one more question before we move on. Julia Gillard also told the ACTU Congress she was distressed, dismayed and disgu disgusted by the poor conduct of one part of the Health Services un Union. That does raise the question, doesn't it, that that one part of the union included Craig Thompson, who the Labor Party pre-selected twice as its MP for Dobell, whose legal fees the New South Wales Labor Party paid and who until recently sat in your caucus as an MP. Well, I think there are question marks about the, uh, the governance of the HSU, and I think there's a broader issue at play, and I think the smart unions are going to be the ones that get ahead of where public debate is, and by that I mean that they're bringing in uh, tighter controls, better governance, uh, and also more accountability for the people that are involved in executive positions within unions, and that certainly the, the move that has been um, started by Bill Shorten talking up uh, the whole review of the, the type of controls of unions, I think, you know, is going to need to be embraced. And I think unions, you know, can't keep arguing that, you know, we've got re enough regulation. I think the fact of the matter is people are going to expect to see uh, tougher, tighter regulation and we're going to need to 
uh, you know, work through that, but unions should get in the front foot and be doing that themselves. And Ellen, if I could ask one, you uh, one question unrelated to that. Sure. We saw the fallout last week uh, uh, between Michael Kroger and Peter Costello, very public uh, fallout and breakup of a friendship. How much impact sure. is that having on the Victorian Liberal Party and is it having wider ramifications, particularly because there are a couple of uh, very tough pre-selection fights coming up? Yeah, I think this was basically a private matter which unfortunately became very public. Um, it was between two um, great Australians, um, two Australians who have made an incredible contribution to our nation. And in the case of Peter Costello, he's, in my view, the, the Australia's best treasurer that we've ever had. But I think to suggest that he might be uh, making another tilt for Parliament is, is frankly fanciful and he has ruled that out completely himself. And you haven't been asked to give up your seat for him? I, I have not been asked to give up uh, my seat for him, Wendell, no. And uh, Ed, um, uh, you'd, you'd be Labor's used to this because we've seen uh, ongoing spats between, uh, between former leaders Bob Hawke and Paul Keating? Yeah, well, uh, uh, I do uh, uh, subscribe to the notion where there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, the fact of the matter is that it's out there. They've both debated it uh, publicly. But what gets me is you've had the man of steel in John Howard and you've got the man with the alfoil spine in, in Peter Costello. Always wide-handed John Howard in, in office. Um, never had the guts to stand up and have the faith in himself to stand up where it was counted. And what gets me more than anything else is that after 20 years of service... Uh, he now, uh, you know, he basically pulled the parachute cord in 2007 when things were tight and wasn't around to rebuild. Now that it's competitive, we hear the doorbell when, 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 and bang, when, when he's here tight. now. On, Peter's here on, to help. Peter's here to help Peter's here to help now. There was six, well, hang on a second. Million dollars in but, the what bank. Gets, but what gets me more than, more than anything thing. else, what gets me more than anything else is he has this eat the young strategy where he's gone for oh, the younger please, members of the Liberal, Ed, Liberal uh, Party no, to try and find a spot for himself. You yeah, well, I believe where the smoke, there's fire. Come on, why, why did... Second, OK, Alan, Ed, explain on, to me, explain to me why did Michael Kroger have to go so forcefully the next day and talk about this issue? Come on, Ed. I mean, where might, there is smoke, there is fire. <laughs> we might move on. Uh, last night on Q&A, uh, uh, Joe Hockey was asked his views about same-sex marriage, uh, uh, views that yeah. uh, that families should have a mother and a father. Uh, he That point was taken up by... By Penny Wong, Alan, do you agree with Joe Hockey that uh, that uh, the issue of um, same-sex marriage and and the issue too of parenting is is one that is linked? Um, I, I listened carefully to what Joe Hockey said last night, and and I actually do agree with what he said, and and basically what he said is that in an ideal situation, a child would grow up with. Um, in, a, in a loving family with their biological father and their biological mother. And, and, and I agree with that proposition, and I say that having grown up in a single-parent household myself. And that's not to say that there aren't um, terrific relationships um, across the board, and these days there's all sorts of different family types, but in the ideal world I think a child would grow up in, in a family with a mother and a father. Unfortunately, that's where we'll have to leave it. Gentlemen, Ed Husick and Alan Tudge, we've run out of time, but thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, thank Lindell. You. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Alan. And thank you for joining Capitol Hill. Please be with us at the same time tomorrow.